room. Who is actually, is anyone actually from Austin in the room? Okay, we have some Austinites, awesome. Okay, and then show me all the Austrians again. Okay, how do we say hello in, in Austrian? Hello. 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 Um, and then, Chi where are you from? From Nigeria. From Nigeria, awesome. I know it, I just wanted to use it. <laughs> <laughs> I have a plant named Chi Chi, and I'm like, Chi Chi's are always from Nigeria. So, okay, great. Um, well, good morning. Uh, we're going to get the deck up, but I'll just maybe introduce myself a little bit while we get it up. Uh, I'm Kanisha Grayson. I am what here in Austin is called a unicorn. Uh, for the Austrians, that does not mean that I crap glitter. Uh, it means that I am born and raised in Austin, Texas, which is very rare these days that someone who is born here uh, is still here. Uh, but I've lived a lot of places. I was talking earlier with Valeria about all the places I've lived. Um, I've lived in Boston, um, which is in Massachusetts. I've lived in California. I've lived in Havana, Cuba. I've lived in uh, Ghana, and then I'm actually going to pick up roots again in September and become a digital nomad. Uh, so I'll be living in London and Paris for uh, September. Okay, yeah, me and Isam are gonna hang, yeah, and do like Parisian things. Um, and then, uh, yeah, there's like so much wine and cheese, which I can't actually eat either of those things. Um, and then I'll be spending October between Austin and California. I'll be in Mexico City all of November. Mex no, me okay, we don't have any. Okay, you're like, I've heard of Mexico. Yeah, yeah, you're from Mexico. Where are you from? Okay, cool. Okay, good. Yeah, and did you come from Mexico for the event? Okay, okay, yeah, yeah, okay, great. Um, yeah, so I'll spend all of uh, November in Mexico City, and then in December I'll be in, uh, in Colombia. Uh, so that's what we have planned out so far. Um, some of the Austrians are pitching Vienna, so that might actually happen. Wow. I, I, yeah, I have like 20 new Austrian friends. Um, so today we're going to be talking about the joy of being wrong. Uh, how many of you like to try something and then it not work? Not many of us, right? But, oh, some people, who was it? It was somebody I thought, okay, Isam, you, okay, you in the back. Why do you like to try things and then figure out they don't work? Uh, I think class, I'm not aware, I think. Okay. neighborhood. I grew up 
Um, in southeast Austin, the neighborhood is called Dove Springs. The zip code is 78744. It's 100% uh, poor uh, and about uh, 80 to 90% Mexican and Mexican immigrant. Um, and that, uh, that's where I grew up. When I was growing up in Dove Springs, I'm 35, uh, what I like to call an old ass millennial. Um, <laughs> the oldest you can be and still be a millennial. Um, and uh, when I was growing up, the neighborhood that I grew up in had the highest teen pregnancy rate in the entire nation. Yeah, so that was what we did for fun. Um, yeah. <laughs> uh, another thing to know is that I have a terrible sense of time, so I need I feel like I feel like Austrians y'all are probably good with time. Is that like a stereotype about Germans that carries over to y'all or no? Y'all are good with time or terrible with time? Good with time. I want somebody to tell me when we are at 30 minutes. Who's my timekeeper, please? I want it to be a man. <laughs> Which am I who, who will do keep the time for me and just tell me like, oh, you're at 30 minutes. You you will do it? What's your name? Mario, okay, thank you. Um, please tell me when I'm at 30 minutes so that then I can take questions, because I don't want to just talk, talk, talk. That will not be very fun for y'all. Um, and then the last thing I want y'all to know is that I had, I was like the original hipster, um, and I dressed like an 80-year-old gamer grandma when I was in fifth grade. <laughs> there <Nice. laughs> Watch out, world. Um, yes. Which is not that different stripes that I'm wearing today. <laughs> we grow up to be who we really are. Okay, so there are some things I did right. We're going to talk about being wrong today, but there are some things I did right. So I graduated from Pomona College, which is a very small private liberal arts college in California, very hard to get into, very prestigious. It was wonderful. Um, I also graduated from Harvard, uh, Harvard Business School and Harvard Kennedy School. So I have my MBA, a Master's of Business Administration, and then my MPA, a Master's of Public Administration from Harvard. While I was at Harvard, I wrote a business plan to uh, launch a business, um, and I won $10,000 for my business plan uh, from Harvard. I also wrote a book. I was the dating advice columnist at Harvard, and I used to run a very popular blog called Crazy Girl Nation. Um, and I turned my most popular blog post and added some more content and turned it into a book called Be Your Own Boyfriend. It's a great fun read, even for the guys. Um, and I saw I wrote and kickstarted that book and we raised over $11,000 from people all over the world for that book. And then I founded my company, uh, The Art of Applying, in 2010. So those are, those are lots of things that I, that I have done right. Um, so first I just kind of want to tell you what my company does. I'm not here to try and like convince some of you to become my clients. Um, although, I would like to say that Alexis, who's the CEO of Three Day Startup, who you just heard from, she messaged me uh, a few days ago saying that she's been on my mailing list for years because she was thinking about going to graduate school and I'm so honored, that's, that's awesome. So thank you for sharing that with me. Um, but what my company does, it's called The Art of Applying and we help people get into top graduate schools. Uh, we help people get money to pay for it, and then we actually just this year started helping our clients once they get into graduate school. We then coach them in how to use graduate school to incubate their idea, so the same way I did. I got my idea while I was in graduate school, and I really feel like there is no type of person that everyone loves to help more than a student. Everybody loves to help a student. Yeah, I love how reactive you are. You're like my guy. Like, I'm gonna, like keep looking at you like, yeah, you. What's your name? John Williams. John, oh, full name, John Williams. I'm gonna keep looking at you. He's like, yeah. Yeah, no, you're great. You're a great audience member, all of you, but especially John Williams. So that's what we do in my company. That's what it does. I've been doing it for 10 years. That's my company. Um, and I just wanted to show you a little screenshot of like a real client and what it's like and just how fun it is and how happy they are. This is my client, David Vasquez. It's funny because we blurred out his face and then I was like, here's his picture. But um, <laughs> there he is. Uh, and so David, uh, David is first generation American. He grew up very, very poor um, in New York City with his mom and his sister. They lived in a one bedroom apartment. Um, and he is first generation from uh, the Dominican Republic and Puerto Rico, his parents. And this is a message that he sent to me and my team. Uh, what's he saying? He's like, I just wanted you to know I got into Harvard Business School. I don't even know how to feel yet. I have a crazy wave of emotion. 
Um, and then I'm going to hear back from Wharton, which is University of Pennsylvania and Stanford. So I'll follow up and let you know. And then lastly, the Knight Hennessy Fellowship, that's a full scholarship to Stanford. Um, that'll come down on Friday. And he did win that scholarship. So he is now at Stanford on a full scholarship, getting his master, uh, getting the two degrees that I have actually, uh, business and policy. Um, and so just very proud. I just want to show you like a real face of somebody that we've helped. Um, if you care, we have hundreds of those little screenshots on my website at theartofapplying.com. We have something called a wall of fame and we just put them and we annotate them and make them look cute. Uh, and just, it's fun for people to see that like it's real and it can actually happen. All right, so some numbers related to my business. We've helped our clients get $12.3 million in merit scholarships. I was talking to um, Nicole and, and Valeria earlier uh, to tell them about all the like scholarships that our clients have gotten because school in the US is so, so expensive. And they were teasing me like, guess how much we need to pay for school in Austria? And it's like negative $5,000 or something. <laughs> but um, in America, it's very different. Um, so getting scholarships is very, very important so that you don't graduate with that bottom number, which is how much I paid off in student loans. Um, so that's, and that wasn't even including college, that's graduate school. Um, and then the middle number is a number I'm very proud of. That was our annual revenue in 2018. Um, and that is how much money we brought in from helping people achieve their dreams of getting into grad school and getting money to pay for it. Uh, a little micro story I wanna share is that um, I was here speaking at Capital Factory just three years ago at an event put on by Nicole in the front row with the camera. And I was saying, you know, we're gonna try something different in the business. I think I wanna scale, because I had been, we've been making like 200, 300K, very centered around me. And I was like, I'm gonna try, I'm gonna just try and scale. Um, and I was saying that at the speaking event that she had me come into, and then we made a million dollars, and it was amazing. Um, so I'll be sharing about things that I got wrong on that journey so that you can uh, avoid my mistakes, learn from my mistakes, and we'll celebrate the mistakes. One thing I do want to share is that my company is bootstrapped, meaning that we don't have investors, we don't have um, like private money. Uh, all we do is we grow the company based on the money, the real money that we bring in. Um, so I'm happy to answer questions around the decision around bootstrapping versus getting investors. We don't have investors not because we like can't get them, it's a conscious choice, so happy to talk about that too. So I think wrong, being wrong is better than being right, right? Because when we're willing to be wrong over and over again, just like Wendy, um, it fuels you as a person, as a professional, as an, and as an entrepreneur, right? It's super easy to be right if you never take risks or never change. If your life stays small, if you do the same things over and over again, of course you're gonna be right because you're just repeating the past over and over again. The only way you can actually be wrong is to try something new and to, to take that step forward into the unknown. And I believe that your success is in direct proportion to your willingness to be wrong. I would like to hear from someone in the audience of just like, even if it's a small example of a time when you took a risk, you were wrong, but like your life is better from it now. And another thing I want y'all to know is I come from Harvard where cold calling is the norm. So like totally fine if you don't raise your hand, I'll just cold call you. <laughs> <laughs> you had your hand up or no? Oh, okay, go ahead. Yeah, what's your name? Hi, Lucas. Hey, everybody. Uh, the time that I was wrong, and it proved out to be better, uh, was actually the startup that I had uh, coming out of college. I did everything that you think you're supposed to do, and I got it all wrong. And what's funny is, is that that learning um, is actually what's, is what's inspired the unconference that I'm doing tomorrow. So a quick plug for that. But it ended up becoming that I learned how important sales was to the actual process of a startup that tends to be overlooked. So I learned on how to focus on what matters most. <laughs> that was a beautiful share. Thank you, Lucas. And I double, triple, underscore Lucas's point about how important learning how to sell is to being a founder who actually has a successful business. Um, no matter how much investor money you have, you have to know how to sell. And that was a game changer for us. Thank you for sharing that. 
So now we're going to celebrate my 10 years of being wrong. I'm here to celebrate with all of you, and I will uh, share some of the ways I was wrong. So, uh, love Lucas, I started my business wrong. Uh, one way I was wrong is I thought I can't have a full-time <laughs> job and start a business. So I started my business 10 years ago when I was coming out of Harvard Business School. And um, I don't know how much you guys know about Harvard Business School, but it is like a feeding frenzy of companies come to be like, we'll pay you whatever you want, just come work for us. And I was like, no, I'm gonna work for myself. And what I would say is like, that was, I don't wanna say necessarily a big mistake, but that was definitely wrong thinking. How many of you have heard or like seen the memes that's like, hustle till you die, like you should quit your job. Like how many of y'all have seen those like, quit your job or you don't really mean it. And like, yeah, and like, no, you don't have to quit your job to start your company. In fact, I would recommend that like, I would recommend that you make sure you have like at least, this is pretty conservative and it's totally not what I did, but like at least five months worth of living expenses saved up before you leave your current income generating situation. Um, it'll be just a lot less pressure. Uh, and also you actually have a lot more like space in your brain to be creative. Lucas, what did you do? In terms of? The quitting your job or having a job or just being like, is this just gonna work or I'm gonna be homeless? <laughs> um, it ended up being the the latter. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. And okay. it came to the point where I don't have any money. I guess now I need to go take a job. So. Yeah. And you, and look, you ended right up, right, where maybe you could have started with a job and then transitioned out into the startup. So that's the first thing I did. I just like, I'm just going to do this all by myself, which makes it all very stressful. Uh, the second thing I was wrong about, I literally, my first year, I said, what's my goal? I'll make a million dollars during my first year of business. Um, that is not what happened. We made about maybe, I don't know, $40,000 the first year as we were trying to figure, you know, as I was figuring out the revenue model. Another thing I was wrong about is, and this is a big one, I went to Harvard Business School. I learned everything I need to know to run a business. Um, who studied business, like maybe even undergrad? You did? What's your name? Angela. Angela. So what? What would you say, um, because I'm not one of those people who's like, don't go to college, I'll be home asleep, but um, I, I am one of those people who doesn't believe you learn what it takes to run a business in business school, so um, I would love to hear what you feel like you did or didn't learn in, in business school. No, I completely agree with you. I went to Texas a and did my MBA, and the, the key takeaway that I had was you need to research, and you need to ask questions, and you need mentors, because the stuff you learn in the textbook is just a model. That's right. And honestly, if something's already made it into a textbook, it's already in the past. It's yeah. already over. Yeah. Yeah. It's already over. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so you do learn a lot of wonderful things at Harvard Business School, but like you're <laughs> not going to learn everything you need to know. Uh, another thing I was wrong about is I, so this slide's extra confusing because of all the negatives. I was wrong in thinking that I made a huge mistake taking on six figures of student loan debt. The Austrians are like, eh, we don't need this slide. But the Americans, um, we, so I, I was like really burdened with this belief that like, oh my God, I made a terrible mistake. I'm an artist, I'm a writer, I'm an entrepreneur. Why did I take on 150K in student loans? Like, what was I thinking? Um, and I really let that get me down, honestly, the entire time that I had them, um, the, seven, the seven years that I had the 150K in student loans. But looking back, I am so grateful that I had those um, loans for two reasons. One is it put a fire under my ass to make money, right? If I didn't have the loans and I had a bunch of investor money to play with, I would have just, I would have done like, these are the kinds of things I do when left to my own devices. Like I would have been that person with like, we have like an indoor swimming pool at the startup and like six ping pong tables. Like that's how I am. Um, but like having to actually think about and learn about and manage money made me so much better with money. It's kind of like the difference between winning the lottery, let's say winning a million dollars and earning a million dollars. It's way better to earn a million dollars because 
if something happens and for some reason you spend it all or lose it all, you can just earn it again. Whereas winning the lottery, you gotta, how are we gonna win the lottery a second time? And the second reason I'm so grateful in the end for those student loans is it made me so much more compassionate for the, I don't know, is the number millions of us in the US who have crushing student loan debt. And instead, I think that if I had been given a full scholarship to Harvard, I would have kind of had this thought of like, well, why do people take on the debt? Like, just don't go. But I remember when I got that letter that was like, you've been admitted to Harvard, there was no, oh, I'm not gonna go. It was like, you go. If you get into Harvard, you go. And so now I am so much more compassionate. If you're willing to admit it, which you should be, because we all have it, who of the, the Americans, or maybe even the international people, have student loans? Yeah, a lot of us. How many of you have, at some point, felt like, why did I get this? Like, why did I get this? That's how I felt. And I just want you to know that, like, even though we're at a crossroads in American education with like how much is college worth and how much is it not with all the boot camps and accelerators and things like that, I just want you to know that like there, you did make an investment in yourself and it wasn't for nothing, okay? And that with the things that you're gonna learn this weekend at Three Day Startup, you can, you can pay off your student loans. You can get a job and have a side gig or have your side startup and you can make the money and pay off your loans. I had 150K and was able to pay it all. So you can definitely pay it all. I was wrong about my clients. Um, wrong, I thought I should try and help everyone because I can. So um, what we do is we help people navigate the really complex process of applying to graduate school in the US. So my understanding for most countries, and I want my, my international people to let me know if I have it right, is that in other countries, going to call the university is basically like, do you have the grades? Do you have the test scores? Write the essay, submit it, and then we'll let you know if you got in and it's probably a yes. Is that basically how it works? She's saying no. Mine you just gotta sign up for a university. Wait, it's even simpler. <laughs> <laughs> I thought that was simple <laughs> <laughs> so it's just like signing up for like an uh, email or whatever and just like, hey, I'm coming. Wow, okay, so that's why I have a business because that's not how it is in the U.S. Um, in the U.S., getting into a top college or top graduate school, and so uh, like maybe like a private, very selective college or graduate school like Harvard, it is a mixture of the Olympics, Miss Universe, mm -hmm. Hunger Games, yep. <laughs> and a Childhood Pageant Show. It is so hard and so confusing and way more confusing for the international people because they're like, but we just sign up. Um, and so that's what my business does is we help people, we hold people's hand through the whole process of applying. Um, who heard about the scandal that happened in the U.S. with all the, ooh, a lot of people. So that's what I do. Um, but uh, that's, that's my industry, but that's, like, I don't do the illegal stuff. We don't do any bribing. We don't do any Photoshopping of people's heads onto athletes or whatever. They were really doing that. Um, but that is what I do. That's my industry. It's called admissions consulting. So that guy, he's like, we're in the same group of workers, but... He's in prison now. Um, <laughs> so the first thing that I was wrong about with my clients is I should try and help everyone because I can. And I just want you all to know, those of you who think you might start a company um, or already have a, an idea, is even if your thing can help everyone, you will be well served by starting with a niche and then spreading out. Because some of the most, even like global brands that we think of now did not start out helping everyone. Nike did not start out offering shoes and apparel to everyone. It started out very narrowly with athletes and a certain type of athlete. I don't know, because I don't know about sports. But I know that they started like very narrowly. And so with my business, I thought, but I can get anybody. I can literally get anybody into a top grad school as long as they do what I say. But that's not compelling. That is not compelling to people for me to say, hey, you got a pulse, can I have some money? I'll get you in. Um, and so what I have learned over the last 10 years is that the people who I 
can help and who it changes their life the most are the people who everybody else told them they couldn't get in. Everybody else told them don't even apply, uh, you're not gonna get in, nobody gets in from your, that your college, your GPA is low, your test scores are low. So now where we really specialize is a lot of our clients have dyslexia, some of them have ADHD, so they're like hyperactive, um, I don't know anything about that. Um, and some of our clients are, uh, maybe they experience some sort of tragedy in college, so they have a semester where they just like got three Fs because it was life was too much. Um, and even though we can help everybody, that's where we've really found our niche is what I call the wild cards. Um, people who have what I call beauty marks on their transcript or in their past. And so I was really wrong in thinking that like, oh, the way to make it big or grow my business is to help everybody. Um, but instead, it's actually to find the people, at least for me, who need my help the very, 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 very most and work with those people. Um, I would actually like to know in the audience, I want to know kind of three categories. How many of you um, are current college students or university students? Okay, a lot of, okay, okay, a lot of you, okay. And then how many of you are like, you've just graduated within the last four years? Okay, a good number of you. And then how many of you feel that you want to start a business within the next year? Okay. Okay, and then what about, you want to start a business within the next five years? All right, and then what about, I just want to get a job and I'm here for the free trip from Austria. <laughs> okay, nobody, okay, what about you just, I just want to have, like, get a job and have an entrepreneurial career within a traditional job? Nobody? It's okay, it's totally good to have a job. Yeah, especially in France, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, another thing I was wrong about is I thought that my clients had to work directly with me to be happy and get results. Um, as you can tell, I have like a big personality, and when I started the business, I was like the driving engine of everything. Um, I was the one going out and getting the clients, serving the clients, do doing everything, and I, I knew like there's no way I'm gonna grow the business, like running around being the only person and so I knew deep down, like, I really want to hire people to help and, like, work with my clients besides it just being me. But a lot of people were like, Kanisha, no way. Like, everybody's coming because of you. They like you. Like, they're not going to work with someone else. And I was totally wrong about that. We now have a team of 20 consultants who work with our clients directly. So think of me now as, like, I'm the person who goes out and does things like this, talks about the business, talks about entrepreneurship. Um, kind of the face of the business, but we now have people who work directly with the clients. And what's amazing is that I would say that they are better than me at helping the clients because it's their sole focus, right? Um, and that we all have different personalities, but that's actually better. Not everybody wants this much, uh, <laughs> this much, you know? So uh, I really want you all, if you have, if you start a business, if you're a sole founder, or you have a partner, don't be scared that like, oh my God, it has to always be me who goes to like um, all the meetings or whatever. Like the sooner you're willing to trust other people, empower other people, the sooner you'll be able to get from under working in the business so much and be able to work on the business. Um, I'm curious about you, what's your name? Daniel. Hi Daniel, tell us about yourself. <laughs> Born in Sarajevo. Okay. United States in 98, mm -hmm. graduated from UT. Awesome. I run a business in gaming, somewhat successfully, based on my own kind of That's criteria. That's exactly right. If you're still, honestly, to me, I'm like, you're still in business, it's success, and even with Lucas, his business closed and he's doing something else, he learned from it, it's a success. Definitely. Awesome. Uh, actually studied in Vienna for a little bit. Oh. That's okay. That's fantastic. Talk to us about this running around and the believing in other people and letting other people actually take on some of the work. You have to meet the right people. You meet a lot of people, a lot of people want to help, but it's not a fit 90% of the time. Mm. You find the right person that's gonna, that understands what you're doing, believes in what you're doing, but also has the ability to do what a part of you does. So I travel to conferences at least 15 times a year. Mm -hmm. So for me, I would need to find someone that's able to talk to the clients while also maybe taking on some of that burden. That's exactly right. Thank you for sharing that. What's the name of your company? Constantine Media. Awesome. That's nice. Thank you for sharing. Um, 
Another thing I was wrong about, is there anybody who runs a business that's kind of a consultative business or like, okay, great, Issam, and then what's your name? Um, behind Issam. Oh, me? Yes. Shelly Bergman. Shelly? Yes. Okay, first we're going to hear from Shelly and then we're going to hear from Issam. So I thought, Shelly was like, what? Um, I just raised my hand. Uh, I thought I was selling my time. I thought I was selling my time or my team's time. Buy an hour with me or buy four hours with my team. And it got to the point where I was charging like a thousand dollars an hour, which sounds like amazing, but like that's still a problem. And I want to hear from Shelly and Issam why selling your time if you have a service-based business is a problem. In the wake of realizing that like at some point 
you can't just hustle harder to make progress, what were some of your lessons? Yeah, totally. And I, um, did everybody hear Kayla share? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It, thank you for sharing that, Kayla. Totally. I had a very similar experience um, in 2018, no, 2017, as, I, as we were scaling up. I ended up getting diagnosed with hypothyroidism. I don't know if anybody has like a thyroid issue, but it's like, you could die. Um, and I, they put me on this medication. And I just still wasn't getting better, and they kept increasing it, increasing the medication, increasing the medication. And then about, actually very recently, two months ago, I just hit a wall and was like, I'm not about to live the rest of my life on increasing levels of medication that doesn't even work. Um, and so I have actually since then slowed way down because I would like to live. I want to have a million dollar business. I want to have a 10, 15, whatever million dollar business. Making money is not the hard part. Managing your emotions are, as you make the money is, is the work. That's the work. Um, and that's really where my focus is now. Uh, the heavy part of that story about my thyroid is when I slowed down, um, I consulted with a few, oh, that's 30 minutes, thank you. Okay, I consulted with a few professionals and an endocrinologist and just told them like, I will do whatever it takes to get better um, and they put me on this like crazy restrictive diet um, and all this like stress relief. And do you know that I am six days away from being medication free? Yeah, thank you. <laughs> thank you, after two years of being on more and more and more medication. So obviously medication in Western medicine is wonderful, but like a lot of, <laughs> the guys in the back up to me. Um, but a lot of a lot of it was just my like hustle grind go go and like I, your health is never worth scaling right we don't want to like scale yourself into the grave. Um, another thing I was wrong about is it's better to just forge ahead rather than slow down to fix a problem. I'm a fast worker. I think fast. I don't want to slow down and like work on stuff. And I have just really I was so wrong about that. There is a, a Buddhist saying that the pain we run away from is the pain we run into. And like on just like a normal level, let's just think about when you're at the grocery store and you're in the long line that's moving really slow and you're like, oh, that line's moving faster. And then you move over to that line and then it's a slow line. So it's just like, just accept the pain of the present moment and move through it instead of trying to avoid it because it's gonna be waiting for you anyway. And so that's something that I've really learned is like when we run into a problem, like it's, it's against my nature. Uh, it really is, but I have found that it's better to just slow down and fix the problem rather than keep forging ahead. Uh, a big thing I was wrong about was making more money will solve my money problems. Uh, but I would say that no, what money does is money is an amplifier of your flaws and the things that are good about you. So it's kind of like alcohol, right? Like it's not like, I heard this on a podcast recently, it's not like if you're a person who loves attention that you're gonna like drink a lot and then become like a cute little introvert in the corner, right? You're gonna be the one like dancing on the table. And like I would say that making a lot of money is very similar to that and that whatever your flaws are around money, you don't track it or you spend too much or you hoard too much or you, um, think people won't like you if you make a certain amount of money, all that's just gonna get amplified. So my money issues were, oh, that's my next slide. My money issues were that I thought, um, I don't need to pay a lot of attention to costs because we're just making so much money. And that's like completely wrong. It's way easier to get yourself in a lot of trouble with money when, you're, when the business is bringing in a lot of money versus when it's actually not. When it's only bringing in a little bit of money, it's like your gamers. Right? But if you're only bringing in a little bit of money, you only have a little bit of money to make a mess with. When you're bringing in a lot of money, you can make a big mess and end up owing the IRS 100K. Okay? Yeah. <laughs> that did not happen. It can happen. Yeah. And I was wrong about happiness. I was wrong about how happiness works. I thought, I'll be happier 
year when I achieved my goals. I'm a pretty happy person, but I had this notion that like, when I get there, I'll be happier. When I make a million dollars, when I get on the Forbes list or whatever, I'll be happier. But that really is not how it works. Like I literally met my goal, made a million dollars, and it was like, no way, right? So I just want to encourage all of you to understand that it's so important to have goals as a founder, as a professional, in your personal life, but those goals should really be about because you it gives you something to look forward to as far as the journey itself. But like the attainment of that goal, it will be great for a few days maybe, and then after that you're just you're still your same self. And the last thing I was wrong about is that I'm happy because life is going well for me. And I actually want to share this idea that I heard on a podcast, which is that how freeing would it be if we accepted the principle that life is 50-50? That we are not entitled to a life of 90% happiness and 10% hard things. What if it's actually that like, no matter how much money you make, no matter how successful or not successful your startup is, that life is actually 50-50. And that 50% of the time we're happy and feeling good and 50% of the time it's sort of crap. And to me, that was so freeing because then when it was feeling crappy, I wasn't feeling crappy about feeling crappy. I wasn't feeling angry about feeling angry. I wasn't feeling frustrated about feeling frustrated. I was like, ah, it's just 50-50. It's just that 50% that's like not that amazing. And that we all have our own 50-50 and it looks a little bit different. But I just wanted to share that because um, I think I was using my business to try and like generate this missing happiness I felt owed. And then once I heard that notion, it really helped me to be like, no, it's just 50-50. Like my business doesn't owe me this like big heaping amount of happiness. Um, it's just, this is just life. And so how do we get getting wrong right? How, how are we wrong in the right way? Be willing to admit that the status quo isn't what you want. If you want something to be different in your life, it does mean you're gonna have to admit that the way things are are not right right now, and that can be painful, but just do it. Um, number two, what's right for you at one point might become wrong for you as you grow and change. That startup that you founded, you might grow out of the startup, and a lot of times the startup grows out of you. Okay, so that's that's a real thing. Uh, don't worry about what other people will think once they find out you were wrong. Uh, that's a big one for me, is like, <laughs> what will I put on Facebook? <laughs> and it's, it's just very important to understand that like everyone's very absorbed in their own life, they're not really worried about you. <laughs> Be willing to ask for help and to even pay for help if you need it. I know we have a mentorship session happening, I think maybe next. Good, so um, make sure you pay attention to that. It's really important to have mentors. You don't have to even call them your mentors, but to have that kind of mentorship relationship. And just because you're wrong about one thing does not mean you're wrong about everything, right? So I can imagine when Kayla hit that wall, she was just like, my whole life is a mess, right? But it's no, no, like your, your life's a mess right now, or today, <laughs> not the whole thing, in the future or the past. And then also be curious about your wrongness. Um, because every time you realize you're wrong, it's actually an opportunity to see what you can learn from that, that wrong experience. Um, so my challenge to you during the rest of this conference is to find opportunities to, to discover your wrong thinking uh, and what you can gain from realizing like, oh, I was actually really wrong about that. And the credits, I had used a lot of free photos um, and this template was free and they asked me to use credits, so there's the credits. Uh, and thank you. <laughs> We've got five minutes.